Jesus Christ invites his followers to think and to live a higher law, one we know today as a path of faith and covenants. As stated in Romans, the invitation for all is to walk in a newness of life. May that newness of life be evident in each thought and deed, and may it lead to a deeper connection to our covenants and a more personal conversion to our Savior. I invite you to join us in our study today and encourage each of us to request divine understanding that the Spirit may teach us individually and specifically. Welcome to Come Follow Up. I think having a newness of life is doing away with the old things that you used to do and creating new habits and creating pure thoughts and just showing the pure love of Christ to others. I think walking newness of life means always seek for Christ and be like Him and always seek for the Holy Ghost to be with you. It means just kind of being a different person than I would normally naturally be. Uh, it's being you know, I kind of fighting between my inner tendencies to want to do things that aren't necessarily right, but saying, I want to be this person. This is, I want to be the best me I can be. I have been spiritually reborn through baptism and weekly repentance, Sundays, sacral meetings. And with that reborn, it keeps me within the light and help me to stay focused on Christ. I feel like my spiritual rebirth is ongoing, uh, a daily kind of rebirth as I learn how to stop living my own life uh, and let Christ live that life in me instead. Welcome, everybody. My name is Ben Lomu, and I am your host. Our gospel scholar for today is Josh Matson. Josh is a scholar of the Bible and the Dead Sea Scrolls and a religious educator with seminaries and institutes of religion. He and his wife, Erin, are the parents of four children and live in Saratoga Springs, Utah. Josh, welcome. And it's a pleasure to be here, Ben. And our special guest today seated next to Josh is Adam Miller. Adam is a professor of philosophy at Collin College in McKinney, Texas. He earned a PhD from Villanova University and is the author of more than 10 books, including Original Grace. Adam, welcome. I'm really looking forward to talking about Romans. And we're also joined by our studio audience. Thank you all for being here today. And to each of you at home, thank you for joining us in today's discussion. Please follow along and share your thoughts with us on any of our social media platforms. Today, we've selected two topics to discuss that relate to passages found in Romans chapters 1 through 6. The two topics we are going to discuss are, first, Jesus Christ invites me to walk in newness of life. And second, my actions should reflect and increase my conversion. So, Josh, as we jump into our first topic, Jesus invites me to walk in newness of life. How does this first topic fit in to the book of Romans? There's a section of epistles called the Pauline epistles that are written by Paul, and this is the first one that we encounter. However, these epistles are generally organized by length not by chronology. Okay. So we've just gotten done with Acts and we've finished getting the whole story of the Acts of the Apostles. And now we're hitting the rewind button and we're gonna go back into the history of Acts, but now we're gonna see letters that were written during various parts of the apostles' lives. Okay. And so Romans is an epistle that was written sometime in the 50s AD by uh, Paul to the Christian saints in Rome. Uh, he'd never met them before. Uh, and so he's writing to them because he's heard that there's a little bit of contention that's going on. And what, where is this contention stemming from? What is it about the Romans that is causing these things to stir up? Well, some of the contention is, is that we have a Jewish group of Christian followers and a Gentile group of Christian followers. Okay. The Jewish Christians are asking, how does the law of Moses still play into our lives? And what about circumcision? And what about ordinances? And the Gentile Christians are like, well, we're just here because of our belief in Jesus Christ. And so there's a lot of questions about what role does Jesus Christ play in the law? And how do we work together as a people to create a new uh, unified group okay. of Christians as opposed to kind of the separated group that we've been living for the first little while of the Christian church? Okay. As we jump into the book of Romans, Adam, what are some things we can look forward to studying or any, any historical or contextual things you want to add to what uh, Josh has told us? Yeah, two things occurred to me in terms of 
context. The first is that if you were to say that I had to spend the rest of my life on a desert island and I could only take one book of scripture with me, I would pick the book of Romans. Okay. And I would pick the book of Romans because I think it's, it's an extraordinary uh, book in relationship to the rest of scripture because it does something very rare. It offers a 10,000 word explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right, we get a lot of stories, we get a lot of poems, we get a lot of parables, uh, we get a lot of prophecies. But the one thing we rarely get in Scripture is any kind of extended explanation. And here we get Paul writing to an audience of Romans who he doesn't know personally. He's kind of starting from scratch, and he's trying to explain from scratch what he thinks the gospel of Jesus Christ is. What does it mean to be a sinner? Why do we sin? How is sin overcome in Jesus Christ? And what does our new life look like? in him. That's the beautiful part, that it's a kind of explanation. And the second thing I think it's important for, for readers to know is that Paul can be a little bit difficult to read in the King James uh, okay. English, right? And I think if people take the time to, to read not just the King James, but in parallel some modern translations, uh, they'll find a lot of doors opening and a lot of lights coming on. This is going to be exciting. I'm really excited to learn from you and from what you've studied through the years on, on the book of Romans and specifically on some of the topics that we're going to be talking about today. But as we jump into our first topic, uh, walking in a newness of life, where does this come from within the text of these first few chapters in Romans? Yeah, so one thing that Paul is trying to teach is what's your role in all of this? So in Romans chapter 6, verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And so it's almost this taking of what happened in Christ's life and saying, how do we do what Christ did? Okay. Adam, what can we learn from, uh, from your study of, of the book of Romans? What does it mean to you as far as the modern application of this phrase, walking in a newness of life? Yeah, the image here I think is really beautiful and connected to our own experience of baptism. Mm -hmm. For Paul, the baptismal imagery revolves around this experience of being buried in the water, of dying, and then beginning a newness of life. But I think the key to the, to the newness of life that's being offered here is that when, I, when I'm buried in the water and I die and start a new life, the life that I'm now living is no longer mine. By way of my baptismal covenants, take his name upon me, and I begin to live a life with him in me. Uh, and I begin to live for and in behalf uh, of Jesus Christ, right? So that he's the one living in and through me. And this new life is a life uh, that's no longer my own, but one that's shared. That's a great explanation. I, I would love to hear from the audience on how has turning to Jesus Christ allowed you to walk with a newness of life? Ashley. Um, I would definitely say that the gospel of Jesus Christ has created new habits for me. I changed what I listened to and what I watched, and, um, and it just helped me to bring more joy into my life and a love for others that I didn't know that was there. Ashley, how does the Holy Ghost help you stay on that path of walking that new life? I feel like the Holy Ghost is definitely present with me more, and so I'm able to feel His presence, and I feel guided by my Heavenly Father with more direction in this life than I ever did. You know, I, I love what Ashley said about, um, it, it's, uh, she's changed the way that she lives her life through Jesus Christ, through walking in this newness of life. What is the significance that it's Paul teaching this, and why does that add more weight to this conversation coming from him? Yeah, Paul is a great example of somebody who was going about the normal business of living their own lives mm -hmm. according to their own lights with their own kinds of goals uh, and then abruptly, dramatically being interrupted yeah. by God, by Jesus Christ himself. And then finding Paul finding himself displaced from the center of his own life such that Christ then becomes the center of his life. Uh, and he finds this new life that he shares then with Christ as he spends the rest of his life as an apostle attempting to, to do what Jesus would do and say what Jesus would say and, and think what Jesus would think mm -hmm. instead, of, instead of what he himself at one point would have said or thought or did. 
So Adam, you spent a lot of time studying um, Paul, Romans, uh, the life of Christ. What was it initially that sent you down that path to really want to dig uh, deep into some of these topics that you study and write about? Paul in particular um, has been really important to me because the one question more than any other that I have wanted to have an answer to is how do I do the thing that the gospel promises can be done? How do, I, how do I go beyond talking about and thinking about or even believing in this new sort of life that Christ offers me to actually doing it, to mm -hmm. living it, to finding myself displaced from the center of my own life, to finding Christ living in me? Uh, and that especially is why I find the kind of the long, clear explanation that we get from Paul of how to do it, right? Uh, very powerful and, and really important. Thoughts? Josh? Well, I, I, I love how Adam's talking about doing something. Uh, throughout the epistle to the Romans, we see the word faith. Okay. And we see that word frequently throughout this text. Uh, but the word there in Greek uh, is pistis and is probably better translated as faithfulness. And there's a little bit of a distinction, especially even in our modern language. We talked about some of the hard ways of understanding this text in a King James version. But if we're thinking... Oh, faithfulness is action. It's not something passive. It's not just a belief. It's actually acting because of that newness of life that we have in Jesus Christ. You know, we often refer to baptism as uh, you enter into the gate. Elder Bednar uh, has a quote talking about what comes next after we are baptized, after we start on this path. He said, and after we come out of the waters of baptism, our souls need to be continuously immersed in and saturated with the truth and the light of the Savior's gospel. Sporadic and shallow dipping in the doctrine of Christ and partial participation in his restored church cannot produce the spiritual transformation that enables us to walk in a newness of life. Rather, fidelity to covenants, constancy of commitment, and offering our whole soul unto God are required if we are to receive the blessings of eternity. I'd like to focus on uh, something that Elder Bednar says on to being continuously immersed. Why is it important for us to understand that once you enter into the waters of baptism, you're just starting out? Well, one of the things that Paul even mentions here um, as he's talking about this idea of coming to Christ, again, going back to Romans chapter 6, verse 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. So he's saying because we've come forth, we now need to live like Christ. Uh, and as Elder Bednar said, this idea of being immersed, uh, that's what the word baptism actually means mm -hmm. in Greek. Baptizo means to immerse in water. And so, and we have to continue to be immersed. Now we don't baptize again and again right. and again, but one of the things that we do is we remember those covenants that we make at baptism when we partake of the sacrament each Sunday. Adam, what are your thoughts on, on this idea of why is it so important for us to understand that once you're baptized, you've never really arrived, but you have to, like Elder Bednar says, stay continually immersed. Yeah, you can imagine a kind of scenario where someone begins this new life in Christ. And they say, this is wonderful. And then they say, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> what? That, it doesn't make any sense. I've right? accepted the, Jesus. I'm good. I can, yeah, the point of, the, of uh, entering into that new life in Christ is to enjoy that ongoing partnership with him, right? To share that mm -hmm. life with him. Uh, and to step aside from or abandon that newly shared life is to, is to abandon the very thing that we were looking for in the first place. So from our audience, uh, as we, you know, as you make covenants, as you dedicate your life to Jesus Christ, what are some of the things that you do to stay continually immersed in the gospel? Lakita. I daily wake up and go to sleep praying throughout the day. I keep my mind focused on Christ, and I continuously listen and read the scriptures and play gospel music, and I try to be very cheerful, making people laugh, being Christ-like in attributes. Um, so that helps me to stay focused. It's a beautiful gift to be led and guided by the Spirit of the Lord, to be prompted our desire is to walk in the light mm -hmm. and to continuously walk in the light. 
I have been of the world and a part of the world, and I choose not to. I just keep my mind focused, and he stays in my corner. Yeah. You know, with his light shining around me, guiding me, leading me. That's beautiful. Thank you, Lakita. Adam, I was really impressed with something Lakita said about uh, it's a daily process. Um, what are some of the things that in, in your daily life that you do to stay continuously immersed and on that path? Yeah, well, by baptism, we enter this new life of grace in partnership with Christ. And, and for me, a big part of staying continuously immersed in that light is learning how to see all of the good that is there in the world for me, right? All of the grace that's continually given, all the promptings, all the calls uh, from God through the Spirit, from the people with whom I interact, uh, to give, to love, to serve, to, to continue to participate uh, in that grace, seeing it and, and doing it. Well, thank you both for sharing uh, your insights and experiences on this first topic of walking in newness of life. And for the audience, thank you so much for sharing uh, your experience as well. And for you at home, how do you strive to walk in newness of life? Share with us on Facebook and Instagram. The actions that I take to be actively engaged in the gospel and to enrich my conversion is being a doer of the faith and not just a hearer. Um, and being able to live that Christ-like love each and every day and to be able to share my testimonies with those that are non-believers. A few daily things that I do to keep in tune with the Spirit is basically making sure that I'm always focusing on something spiritual as I start my day and then trying to do the same throughout it. I try to serve because when I think of the Savior, I think of service. There's nothing, it, it, his life was service. And my covenant with him through my baptism is to carry his name and I carry through service. The daily work of increasing my conversion to the Savior involves all the ordinary work of praying, studying, uh, reading, of serving. Uh, but in lots of ways, it boils down to the work of just trying to be more and more sensitive and aware of what the Spirit wants me to do. The second topic we're gonna to discuss is my actions should reflect and increase my conversion. So once we've entered into, as we talked about in our first topic, we start this newness of life, and we kind of mentioned it before, that's just the beginning. So what's the next step? How are we expected to act once we've started on this path. Yeah, well, one of the things that we're expected to do is we're supposed to live differently than we did before. Mm -hmm. Keeping the context in mind of Romans, Paul is trying to balance between a group of Jewish Christians who are still kind of following the law of Moses and the strict, rigid commandments that are there, and also Gentile Christians who may have come from a background where there wasn't any expected lifestyle. Okay. So Paul's way of trying to balance this is he says, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then continuing in verse 17, for therein is the righteousness of God re revealed. From faith to faith, it is as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now again, the word faith here is that pistis, mm -hmm. the just shall live by faith. Faithfulness. faithfulness. So how can you best exemplify what you've just experienced? Walk a faithful life. All right. And we talk about this, um, verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, specifically from Paul's perspective, Adam, what are your thoughts on what Paul is trying to teach these new converts about not being ashamed and how that should be reflected in their actions? Something very potentially embarrassing happens, I think, when you begin to live the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that you stop living your life the way that all the people around you mm -hmm. are living their lives, right? Your priorities are no longer the same as their priorities. Uh, your goals are no longer the same as their goals. And as you start to swim upstream, uh, it's easy to look silly and foolish, right? And to feel the pinch of that. Uh, but owning what's involved in that new life is, is the key, right? Trusting here in God's promise, in the new life that he is giving you, being faithful to it, uh, despite the potential 
embarrassment or shame mm -hmm. involved in, in being such an odd duck. Uh, that's key. Okay, so from our audience, uh, what are some things that you do that show that you are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Claire. You can share the gospel with your friends and family and invite them into that new lifestyle. That's really good. Claire, what has the gospel done for you to make your life better? I like knowing that Heavenly Father is always there for me and that the Holy Ghost can help me improve my choices. These are extremely viable lessons and, and at such a young age, for a lot of these converts, they don't have that. They're, they're Like you said, Adam, they're changing their whole life. They, this, this is a lifestyle they've lived for a long time and now they're switching over. I think sometimes it can be really difficult. We go to church on Sunday, we make these covenants, but what happens between Monday and, 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 and Saturday, I think can be really challenging. And we had a question that came in from one of our viewers that touches on this, and I would love to get some of your thoughts. Hi, my name is Nina and I'm from San Antonio, Texas. My question is, I know that I can become more like Jesus Christ through making covenants, but what can I do every day to become more like him? It's good always to hear from a fellow Texan. <laughs> um, I mean, for me, it always comes back to learning how to live in the grace that Christ is offering, right? Learning how to see it, number one, by way of gratitude, right? Gratitude uh, is a recognition okay. of grace. When I feel grateful for something, that's my recognizing it as the gift that it is, as the good that it is. And then kind of, uh, as Claire was indicating, right, kind of, constantly cultivating this sensitivity to the graces that are then needed from me. What does my wife need from me today? What does my son need from me today? What does this student need from me today? Regardless of what it was I thought I wanted to be doing, uh, what's, what's needed? Okay, I wanna explore this idea because Adam, you've written a lot about grace and, and Josh, um, from your experience, I, I, grace is something that um, I have always misunderstood. Can you give us an explanation uh, of what grace is, where do we get this term grace for grace, and then how do we better understand it? Yeah, so to, to address the question of this idea of grace, uh, here in Paul, um, in Paul's epistle to the Romans, he frequently uses the word charis uh, in Greek, which we translate as grace. But it's more connected to the Hebrew word chesed, which means loving kindness. Uh, let me maybe illustrate this through a metaphor. Okay. Um, is that this is somebody giving you something you cannot receive on your own. Okay. For example, let's say a job. So you come to somebody and they give you a job. You can never turn around and give that job back to the person who yeah, gave it to you. I can't pay back a job that they gave me. It's like, okay, like I can't do that. You're yeah, right. so you can't do that. So the idea of grace here is more about the fact that a benefactor has come in and given you something that you can't give. Okay. And so now the question is, is what do you do to show your appreciation for what you've been given. I work my tail off. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I'm a good employee, you know, to, to, to thank them for giving me this job, I'm gonna be the best that I can be. And, and Paul uses faithfulness as that juxtaposition. Okay. So we have grace that's given to us through the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And what we give back is faithfulness. Okay, so you have this inward conversion. So how should our outward behaviors and actions reflect the grace that we receive? What are your thoughts, Adam? Yeah, it reminds me of uh, this phrase that Paul uses when he describes the Christian life as a life that's lived under the law of faith, he calls it. And he contrasts the law of faith with the law uh, of works. There's, there's a useful passage here uh, in Romans chapter 3. Paul says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, he says, but by the law of faith. And that, I think, is, is the crux of the kind of conversion that, that we undergo. Uh, we undergo a fundamental change in how we experience the law and what we think the purpose of the law is. And we go from living, uh, experiencing the law in terms of works to experiencing the law in terms of trust and faith 
and faithfulness. And this law of faith then unfolds uh, in line with grace itself. The law of faith takes grace as God's law, such that we begin to live our lives in line with Jesus' description in the Sermon on the Mount, where we love not only our friends, but we love our enemies. Mm -hmm. And returning good, not just in return for good, but returning good in response to evil, that's a paradigm case of grace. And I love what Adam's saying here because it almost sounds like we act well, we do good, not because we get a reward, but because we do it just to do it. Just to do it. Yeah, okay. the, it's not, I'm doing this because it's a transaction. I'm doing this because I have committed to change and to be good for being good's sake. Okay. So why is it so misunderstood, this, this concept of grace, and why has it caused so much controversy uh, among some of the religious sects? Well, I think even Paul is addressing this here, is that it becomes kind of a, a difficult topic because, well, if grace is the only thing that saves, if we're just getting that job, mm -hmm. no matter what, because Jesus died for us and we're getting that forgiveness, what, what's the expectation? Uh, and so over time, sometimes there's been a pendulum that's swung between various faith traditions and even within a faith tradition over time where it'll be like, well, I still have to do something. Uh, you know, it's the idea that Christ says that those who enter into his kingdom aren't just those who hear my word, but those who do my word. And so it's like, well, what does it mean to do? And sometimes we push it too far to one side and then we come back and we go, no, no, no. This is exactly what Martin Luther was trying to do with mm -hmm. the Catholic Church is he was trying to say, wait a second, we've emphasized works way too much. We need to come back and recognize that we can't work our way to heaven. Okay. Uh, and so there's it's sometimes this interpretation that goes back and forth. Yeah. There's a quote by uh, President Dallin H. Oaks uh, talking about what our actions can lead us uh, to in addition to the grace we receive. He says, it is not even enough for us to be convinced of the gospel. We must act and think so that we are converted by it. In contrast to the institutions of the world, which teach us to know something, the gospel of Jesus Christ challenges us to become something. So what is the difference uh, between having a testimony and being truly converted? I think true conversion involves my actually learning to see the world as Christ sees it in light of grace, right? In light of the law of faith rather than the law of works. I think part of the confusion with respect to the doctrine of grace has to do with the way that it's very hard for us as natural men, as natural women, as as natural folk, uh, to break out mm -hmm. of that works mindset, right? To break out of that, of that me-oriented, earning, gaining, acquiring mindset and see the world then in this fundamentally new way that's in light of grace. And then to reread our whole understanding of ourselves and the world in light of, of that law. As Adam was speaking, I, I was thinking, yeah, and, and sometimes we fall into that pitfall, uh, even going back to our analogy, that sometimes we are employed and maybe we're given a job out of the kindness of someone's heart. And then sometimes we start to feel entitled. Okay. And we start to say, no, 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 look at how good I am. And sometimes as human beings, we do that naturally. We forget about what it was like before we received that blessing. Once you enter into that path, there's there's so much more. And I'm sure for Paul, it's quite the challenge to go from just conversion to that deep, lasting conversion. Why is it there's this drive to really get them to have that deep, deep conversion? What does he know uh, about what is to come that is going to be necessary for them to have that deep conversion that they that we still try strive for today? I th I think that that kind of deep, deep conversion involves the discovery that the conversion is not just a means to an end, okay. to some other end, or even meeting whatever kind of problems life may send your way. But that experience of conversion, of beginning a new life in partnership with Christ, that's the goal also okay. at the same time, right? It's how you get there, but in some crucial sense, you're already there once you begin to participate in the partnership, because living in the presence of God, being filled with His Spirit, walking in partnership with Him, that's not, that's not just the means, it's, it's the goal. 
Well, thank you both for sharing your thoughts and insights with us on our second topic of increasing our conversion. And for the audience, you've been wonderful. Thank you so much for being here and for sharing your thoughts and experiences with us as well. And for those at home, we still have so much to cover in footnotes. Stay with us. The Spirit communicates with me through others, mostly. The Spirit communicates with me through promptings. It's a gift God has given me. It leads me, it guides me, and it directs me. It tells me where I should go, what I should do, even most of the time what I should say to people. Through others, I have my answers. Most of the times with the actions or something they say, even social media, something they post, always connects me to the Lord. Most of the time, uh, you know, if I'm praying and whatnot, I'll get uh, a warmth in, yeah, they call it a warmth in your heart or whatnot, but in my chest. Uh, but sometimes it's, uh, my whole body tingles and I'll get a prompting of, you know, hey, you need to do this. And my whole body will tingle and I'll go, oh, well, I definitely ought to better, you know, I better do something about it. It's like uh, President Monson says, you, you gotta do something about it because you don't wanna end up regretting uh, a missed opportunity. Welcome to Come Follow Up Footnotes. We've dismissed our studio audience and are looking forward to building upon our previous discussions about Romans 1 through 6 with Josh and Adam. Okay, uh, before we jump in, uh, I thought it'd be beneficial for us and for our viewers to just get a little bit of background on you, Adam, and your work. Uh, what are some of the things you do uh, as far as, you know, as it pertains to what we're studying in the book of Romans and the topic of grace? Just give us a little history on your education and what you do for your career. Yeah, well, I'm a philosophy professor. Okay. Not an actual New Testament <laughs> scholar. <laughs> uh, but I became a philosopher because I wanted to think about God mm -hmm. and religion. Uh, and I wanted to gather up as many useful tools as, as I could. And in particular, I wanted to think about grace. So for the past... 20 years since I started working on my dissertation in the, in the early 2000s. Grace has been my daily topic of study and writing wow. and, and conversation. And uh, for me, a lot of that work uh, came back to a reading of Paul's epistle to the Romans. It was kind of ground zero mm -hmm. for me and my, my experience of grace and thinking about grace in a Christian context. Uh, and since then, I've I've written a couple of academic books on the topic of grace, and I've written uh, a couple of books for Latter Day Saint audiences on the topic of grace, uh, and I've written a number of other books that pretend that they aren't about grace, <laughs> but that are still actually about <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> about grace. <laughs> so what 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 started it all? You know, we're as we study Romans. What was the beginning of your uh, journey into grace, specifically as it pertains to Paul's writings in, from Romans, as you've mentioned? For me, the way into what I think Paul is trying to say came for me in Romans chapter 1, uh, especially in verses 18, 19, and 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. What he means here is that uh, to be a sinner is to be a person who is holding back or holding down or suppressing the truth, right? That there's a kind of lie at the heart of being a sinner. Uh, there's a kind of rejection uh, of something in particular. We both know it in our heads, but also feel it just in terms mm -hmm. of a fear uh, in our guts. Uh, and in many ways, it's, it's the, the only antidote for that fear at the end of the day is, is trust. Uh, but it's hard at first, especially you, know, you get thrown into the world as a baby, you don't, you don't understand anything. <laughs> and almost uh, inevitably, Paul says, right, we all end up in this position of sinners as, as running away mm -hmm. from this truth and, and hiding from it. 
And that truth, as he describes it here in verses 19 and 20, has to do with something that's already obvious and manifest, right? It's kind of truth that's hidden in plain sight, as Paul puts it. And, and what a, a great way that it's stated here in verse 19, right? That is known of God that is manifest in them. And I think sometimes we're not as gracious with others in that process. Uh, and I don't think that we're, we're born automatically knowing everything that's good or everything that's right. Like we, we learn that over time and God almost teaches us that to us line upon line and precept upon precept through experience. If it's very widely manifest to the world to, to experience him, to know what he has created and given us, you know, we go through time where through different experiences and different teachings that creep in, it's almost as if we are being led by the adversary to try to forget all of that and focus on other things that would draw our attention away from all those good things that he's provided and given to us. Yeah, the phrase that comes to my mind is the phrase from the Book of Mormon, uh, that some people had gotten to the point where they were past, past feeling, feeling. Mm -hmm. is that, you know, at first they're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But then they continue. So God had given him that witness. Hey, this isn't, this isn't right. Uh, we call it a conscience sometimes, mm -hmm. but you, we know the light of Christ or, or the spirit. Um, and they just continue to put it off to the point where that spirit can't manifest in that point anymore. How does grace fit in with those that never get the opportunity to hear about the goodness of God or see or witness all that he has provided for us? How does grace fit in with, with those um, as opposed to, you know, people who are born and raised in an environment where they're taught about God and Christ? Well, isn't it great that the plan of salvation doesn't stop after this life? Uh, for us as Latter-day Saints, we know that our learning and our progression continues beyond the mortal existence that we have. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's another manifestation of God's grace is that this life is not the only time that we have to be able to understand and, and learn those things. And we do see, I think, Paul addressing exactly that question in the chapters that immediately follow here, in many ways, chapters two and three. On the one hand, why those who have received the revelation, right, the Israelites, uh, aren't super special and different from everybody else, right? Because he talks in chapter two about how the Gentiles, without even knowing the law, have still in many ways been able to keep yeah. the law, right? Which is part of what's at stake here in verse 20, right? It's, it's already manifest just in the creation of the world itself without any special additional revelations. But then he also has to then go back in chapter three and then explain why the revelations are still so crucial uh, and important, despite the fact that uh, so much of the law is manifest just in our hearts and minds by way of the light of Christ. You know, something that we talked about earlier in the episode was where do we find that, that balance of trying to bring these two uh, philosophies or ideologies or way of living together? Well, uh, the, and the answer is Jesus. And so bringing them together is what Paul's ultimate purpose here is, is you have all accepted Jesus Christ as the Savior. Mm -hmm. And because you've accepted him as the Savior, now let's come to a common ground. Okay. Uh, and, and it's manifest here in, in Romans chapter three, Paul writes, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Now, that word propitiation there, we look at that and we might step back and go, whoa, what the, this is a big word. I've never heard this before. Uh, one commentator on this text has actually said a better translation of that word is a sacrifice of atonement. Um, and so that's something we are a little uh, more attuned to mm -hmm. hearing. But what's really interesting about the New Testament is the atonement of Jesus Christ is the central topic but it's referred to in so many different ways. And this is one of them, is that here Paul in, in verse 25 is saying that the sacrifice of the atonement of Jesus Christ through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Uh, if we understand sin uh, as Paul describes it in the first chapter as a kind of uh, holding back or suppression, uh, of the truth mm -hmm. about ourselves and about creation and about the grace that God is trying to give. Then Jesus, we can see Jesus described here uh, in verse 25 in particular uh, as solving that problem uh, because he is whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation 
for sins. The idea in Greek is straightforward here, that, that what God is doing is displaying, right? He's, he's setting out, setting forth, displaying Jesus as a kind of re-manifestation of all of those truths, of all of that grace, of all of that glory that we had been suppressing all along. And it's as, as, it's as God's righteousness, right? It's, it's God's righteousness that's manifest in this display of Jesus. It's his glory that's manifest there uh, that then overcomes all of that hard work we've done to hide it and run away from it. And he's kind of uh, opens the door then to our being ushered back into the presence of, of the grace and glory we've been running from. And, and to flip this as well is this is also the, the display that has to go forward above our own works. Yeah. Because as Paul was talking about earlier, we can't work our way to receive that grace. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, the idea yeah. is that because of Jesus, it doesn't matter if you don't have the law or you're suppressing or sinning, or if you've been working to be righteous in Jesus Christ and his atonement, there's no difference between those two original paths that led to him. So where's that awakening that takes place um, where we start to realize and understand that the atonement is something that is real that we can implement in our lives. There's a special technical term I think Paul has for describing that moment, and it's what it's the word faith, right? Faith is his description of how I trust in this thing that God is revealing instead of running from it in okay. fear. And it's that coming into a position of, of trusting what God is showing me, even maybe especially when it doesn't look like what I thought I wanted, uh, and often it won't, right? <laughs> uh, the life that God is giving me in Christ to share with him and to share in that righteousness is not going to look like the life that I thought I wanted to have. Yeah, and Paul does such a great job of giving an example of that um, with Abraham. So in Romans chapter 4, he uses this word faith, uh, and, and earlier we talked about that, that can also be this idea of faithfulness, uh, that it's an, that action aspect of it. And the father of circumcision, meaning Abraham, to them who are not of the circumcision only. So now we're saying, okay, wait a sec. Now we're dealing with both those who are of the circumcision, the mm -hmm. Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, um, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. The faithfulness of Abraham happened before circumcision. Uh, and we can view circumcision here as an ordinance. Mm -hmm. And so Abraham was faithful even before going through an ordinance. It wasn't the ordinance then saying, oh, I'm going to be faithful. Yeah. It's leading up to that. And, and we see that. Um, we see that uh, in a modern context Absolutely. of Latter-day Saints uh, is when we teach the gospel to someone, oftentimes they've been living a faithful life. And we even expect people to live a faithful life up until until they decide to be mm -hmm. baptized. Begin your faithfulness now. Don't wait until later. So when, when does that change happen? Well, when we have that desire, start living faithful today. And even when, as, as after you enter the, the waters of baptism, you know, as you progress in the gospel and you make more covenants, you have to, you know, at least demonstrate that you are, are willing and ready to, to make that covenant before you actually do. You know, living the law of chastity, obeying, you know, the, the word of wisdom, following the commandments, uh, you have to show that, look, I, am, I have, have been doing this and I will continue to do this even after I make that covenant. And, and I love how Paul sets that up in chapter four, where he says, okay, so Abraham was faithful. And then God came to him and said, here's the promise I have for you. And as a token of remembrance of this promise, now I'm going to give you circumcision okay. as an outward expression of the covenant that you've made. And so it's a reminder that you've made a covenant, now act upon that. And uh, a lot of the ordinances that we do even today have a similar component mm -hmm. where we have uh, aspects of remembering the covenants we've made. When we're baptized, we remember through the ordinance of the sacrament. When we receive the ordinances of the temple, we receive the temple garment as a remembrance, as an outward manifestation of the covenants that we've made. Not because it says, oh, look at how cool I am, but because it says, each time I see this, it reminds me of the commitment that I've made to be faithful. So Paul gives us the, um, the example of, of Abraham, uh, of, of this faithfulness, of you know, practicing without that ordinance, without that covenant. One question that I had that I was really curious about is if we go back just one chapter to Romans chapter three, and it's in verse 10, 
Uh, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, that can kind of, you know, sting a little bit if you if you look at it too literally. What what, what is what is the meaning behind this of calling none that are righteous? What is Paul trying to teach uh, the Romans? My inclination would be to take us back to that kind of ground level verse in uh, chapter one uh, that being a sinner here means attempting to hide the fact that I can't be righteous by myself. Okay. Right. So it's a kind of, it manifests as a kind of pride. It manifests as a kind of self-idolatry, right? Uh, to break through the lie that I've been telling about myself as a sinner, right? Paul has to really hammer home here in chapter three, the fact that no, you aren't God. You aren't <laughs> right. You can't be righteous on your own. And that in fact, at the end of the day, which is where he's heading here in chapter three, at the end of the day, the only way to be righteous is to enter into a partnership with God and participate in his righteousness. Righteousness, by definition, is not the kind of thing that I can do on my own, by myself. Uh, righteousness is the kind of thing that only happens in community, in partnership with God. It's something that can be only be shared, right? It has to be done together. Do you see a connection with grace and righteousness, that righteousness is kind of a form of, of grace that we're given? Yeah, very much, very much. Uh, grace is the key to our justification, which is how that word, the word is often used here in King James to describe God's righteousness in action, right? Uh, God's righteousness in action takes the form of love, mm -hmm. which is a kind of, which is grace, right? Giving uh, good both in return for good and in return for evil. Uh, and then it's in my willingness to participate. And, and as you were speaking, Adam, I couldn't help but think back to how Paul addresses the Roman saints. In Romans chapter one, verse uh, seven, he says to all that be in Rome, beloved of God called to be saints. Yeah. Now the word saints there uh, in, in the Greek is agioi, which is holy ones or those ones set apart. And so I loved how you, you explained that, Adam. I was thinking, oh, Paul even starts at the beginning by saying, this is who you're intending to be. And for us as Latter-day Saints, that may be a new way to look at mm -hmm. calling ourselves saints, mm -hmm. is that we've been set apart, but set apart to what? Set apart from the world to be one with God. Yeah, and it gives us maybe another way to think about what's happening in Romans chapter four with Abraham, is that there's a sense in which Abraham is already in relationship to God, right? God uh, has not given up on Abraham. He's always there. Uh, his commitment to Abraham is unconditional. Abraham may not know it, or he may be hiding from it or running from <laughs> it, uh, but that relationship in some sense is already in effect such that Abraham can be faithful, can learn how to be faithful to that partnership even before it's been formalized in the form of a covenant. Yeah, and, and our identity. I think of President Nelson emphasizing time and time again that we as Latter-day Saints, our very first identifier that we should recognize is that we are children of God, mm -hmm. which means all of us are like Abraham. We already have a, an existing established relationship with deity that we need to continue to build upon. Yeah, we suppress it or we display it, and we display it by entering formally, publicly into these covenants. And one of the covenants we talked about earlier was the covenant of baptism. And we see a, there's a great discussion in here in chapters five and six about entering into the waters of baptism and the, the representation of death of our old self uh, and becoming new, walking in this new newness of life. Can we vi revisit chapters five and six and just have this discussion about the role of death as it pertains to baptism. Yeah, and, and maybe I can set the scene with chapter five and then Adam, you can pick up with the actual discussion okay. of baptism. Sure. But one thing that Paul brings up starting really in, in verse 12 is uh, in Romans chapter five, verse 12, Paul starts to discuss this idea that because of Adam and the transgression that Adam made in the Garden of mm -hmm. Eden that instituted the fall, two things were brought into life, and that was spiritual death and physical death. Uh, and all of us as descendants of, of Adam and Eve would inherit those two types of death. Mm 
Uh, and so what Paul does in chapter 5, verses 12 through 21, is he sets up these two different ends. Because of Adam, we're going to inherit spiritual and physical death. Mm -hmm. But because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can overcome that. And so he's really setting up this idea that Jesus Christ is offering us his grace, that gift to be able to overcome those other two. Mm -hmm. But the, it's done symbolically through baptism and, and, uh, and gives us some more insight into who we become after that. And, and at the end of Romans chapter six, I love that, that we get this word that is used here and it's, it's a lot lighter here than, than the Greek text. Uh, starting in verse 18 of Romans six, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. Mm -hmm. Now that word for servants in Greek is mm -hmm. not a servant, it's a slave. Um, and you've become fully committed. Uh, to, to righteousness. Uh, continuing in verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. There it is, right? You're going to make mistakes mm -hmm. because the flesh is weak. Uh, For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanliness unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. And so this idea is, is that who are you going to let have dominion in your life? Yeah. Are you going to let God or are you going to let sin? Um, and the promise is, is if you let God, verse 14, going back, Paul says, for sin shall have no dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. And so now we've come all full circle that when we trust, and I love, Adam, that you've given those, that word, uh, it's going to change the way that I think of uh -huh. this from now on, is when I give my trust over to God, then I don't have to live in fear. Uh, that fear of, oh, I have to be right, perfect, or, oh, I have to do it this way, because I know in whom I trust. Yeah, I think the Book of Mormon is really helpful here in trying to think about the nature uh, of death as it enters into the world by way of Adam. Because you can get the impression in the New Testament, right, that the, the onset of death is just a kind of unmitigated disaster, that in some way the fall uh, was spoiling God's plan mm -hmm. for creation. But in the context of the Book of Mormon, it becomes clear that even death itself is a kind of gift, is a kind of grace that God is trying to give us. Uh, and this, of course, then is part of what we also are running from, right? Uh, suppressing uh, these gifts that come in the forms uh, that we don't uh, necessarily want, like death. And part of what happens here then in chapter 6 with baptism, with its symbolism of, of death and burial and resurrection, is that Christ is giving us the chance to embrace death, not as a kind of punishment, but as a kind of gift that opens the door onto a new life then with him. I can put down my vain attempt to live my life in my own name, die, and then take up a new life in which I live that life in his name rather than my own. In, like like in, a, in a spiritual sense, yeah. spirits, they're going to put this away and then be reborn as the Savior often taught about this rebirth, this re newness of life. Yeah, there was a kind of, it's really a kind of a, a formal act of surrender, right? Okay. <laughs> Which I'm surrendering, I'm, I'm literally uh, formally publicly saying, I surrender my life here, I'm surrendering my own name, and from here on out I'm taking the name of Jesus Christ, and the life that I live will be his now, not, not mine. And that turns out to be liberating. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful way to, to wrap up this discussion, this episode. This has been wonderful, Adam. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel like I've learned so much uh, about grace, yet I have so much to learn. Mm -hmm. and, and you've really kind of provided this um, opportunity to really jump into uh, learning more. And Josh, it's always a pleasure to be able to work with you uh, as well. So thank you both for giving your time to be here today. And thank you for joining us at home for this discussion from these initial chapters in Romans. I encourage you to record and act upon any impressions you've received. Come Follow Up is a learning and teaching resource. For clips, insights, artwork, and additional materials, visit byutv.org slash comefollowup. Join us next week as we study Romans chapters 7 through 16 and discuss following the Spirit and true discipleship. Thank you for watching.